as uh, Seba said, John Dixon apologized he couldn't be here today. He had a family thing come up, uh, but asked me to deliver this. So if you like this talk, it's due to the high quality of my delivery. If you don't like it, it's because the deck is crappy. Let's just, <laughs> but uh, so what we want to talk about today is a little bit of the work that has been going on with, open, with the OpenSAM project and some things that we've learned in working with organizations, especially organizations that are making the move to agile or DevOps type, uh, types of approaches. Um, want to talk about some lessons learned that we've found along the way on how you can, um, uh, how you can have more success um, in those environments. You know, if you think of how many people are familiar with the CMMI, Capability Maturity Model, right? You see a lot of, a lot of organizations that talk about DevOps and CMMI in the same sentence, right? <laughs> no, <laughs> um, you know, because they're, in, in a lot of ways, they're, they're the opposite of one another. And so what we've found is a resistance in a lot of cases um, for organizations that are pushing more agility and pushing for more DevOps, we've seen a resistance um, to using or relying on any sort of a, of a maturity model. So I wanna talk a little bit about some things we've found that have helped us have success with those, or, or to use a framework like OpenSAM in those environments. Um, a little bit of background, um, we'll, pro we'll provide a little bit of background. Uh, talk about an overview of the software assurance maturity model. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit about some of the work that we've done with some benchmarking data that we're trying to gather based on OpenSAM. Um, then I'll talk about the business drivers that a lot of organizations find themselves in uh, that cause them to make moves to adopt more agile practices and adopt more DevOps practices. And one of the things, uh, you know, that's, it's, it's interesting talking to different groups, I, I suspect this group will be more receptive um, you know, in, when I speak at ISSA or a lot of very more traditional security groups, you know, they can't believe, uh, you know, they're, they're blown away by the thinking of Agile and DevOps and don't think that their organization will ever adopt it. Well, they're wrong. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about the business drivers that make this a reality. Again, in an OWASP environment with uh, more of a development culture, I suspect that uh, this group understands a lot more of the push for Agile, the push for DevOps. Um, then we'll talk about strategies that we've found to make OpenSAM more effective, or how you can have more success with OpenSAM initiatives in organizations that are pushing for more agil agility in DevOps. And again, happy to answer any questions along the way. Um, I just need to remember to repeat the question, which I did approximately 40% of the time in the previous talk. Um, that's a picture of John Dixon, who is not here today. Uh, that's a picture of me, and I am here today. Uh, and again, I, I mentioned this previously, one salient or relevant thing about my background is, um, you know, I'm a developer by background. Uh, did a lot of uh, you know, server-side Java stuff in the mid, mid to late 90s, a lot of uh, early ASP.NET stuff in the early 2000s, and really for the last decade, what I've done in my career is helped or, or looked at how developers and, and, and the software that they build, how that impacts the security of the organizations that are fielding those systems. And so I'm a developer who has come into the world of security as opposed to being someone from a more traditional network uh, security, network penetration ba testing background that is now looking at web and mobile apps. And so from a culture standpoint, I think that puts, uh, you know, that puts me in a situation also to understand a lot of what is going on uh, with the push for Agile, with the push for, uh, for, for DevOps, um, and hopefully that's of, of value. So an important thing to understand is that value and risk are not equally distributed. If, you ha if, you, if your organization has a portfolio of 100 applications or 1,000 applications, the value in that portfolio is not, you know, each application is not the same. Uh, you know, some applications matter more than others. Um, you know, they have more valuable data, they have different types of data, and that makes them more valuable to the organization. Um, you know, there may be, you know, if you look at the value of the transaction being processed by an application, if you look at the cost of downtime, the cost of a breach, also, you know, privacy, regulatory concerns. Um, you know, there's a, a saying that if, uh, if, if, if everything is important, then nothing is important, right? Or if you, if, you, if you ascribe the same amount of importance to everything, then, you know, then that importance can be, like, 
100 units of importance or a million units of importance because it's all spread equally. And, and that robs from you the ability to make decisions and prioritize. And I think that's something that's very important as you try to develop software security programs. Um, you, know, you have limited resources at your disposal and that forces you to ruthlessly prioritize um, and to make risk-based decisions. And as a result of this, you know, all, all, all applications shouldn't be treated the same. And all teams developing applications shouldn't be treated the same. And we'll talk uh, uh, more about this in, you know, coming up, but I think an important thing to recognize when you look at the concept of maturity from, the, you know, you know, from, from any standpoint, really, in an organization, but if you look at the concept of maturity as it relates to the security practices of a development team, you're really talking about the security practices of a development team. And so if you go into any organization uh, of, of, of any size, you know, any organization of any size, and what you'll find is they don't have one way that they do development, right? They have as many different ways of doing development as they have teams. Uh, you know, a couple years ago, I went into an organization, a retail organization, and said, okay, well, for you know, PCI prep purposes, we need to talk about you know, your methodology. And they pointed to the wall with a uh, you know, four foot by eight foot, whatever that translates to in meters, but a piece of plywood sized poster on the wall and said, that's our development methodology. And it had little boxes and arrows and all that thing. And I said, okay, and so this is how everybody does their work? And, yeah, okay, good. So for your team, explain to me how you do this part of the QA process. And they're like, well, our team doesn't actually do that, right? As we drilled down, again, what we identified was every team was doing something different because they had different drivers, they had different, uh, you know, a number of different factors. And so you can't treat all applications the same and you can't treat all teams the same. And so that's something also to understand as you go into your organization, a team that's developing line of business applications that are internal facing, they're probably going to have a different set of security practices and a different level of maturity when compared to a team that is developing a internet facing high transaction volume XYZ application. Um, and that's great, uh, but that's also an important thing, I think, for folks to understand as they try to push these programs out and as they try to grow the maturity of those programs is you know, you're going to have different factors, different business factors that are ultimately going to determine the business's appetite for risk. And that will then translate into different activities um, you know, within that specific team. So there's a number of software assurance frameworks out there. There's uh, you know, the you know, Flasks, there's the Microsoft's SDL. Uh, Microsoft uh, SDL has different variants. Uh, you know, there's uh, you know, an, any number of different frameworks out there. And with SAM, you know, the intent was to create an open framework that, are gonna, that helps organizations to figure out where they are. What is the maturity level of a given team? and to make plans to advance the security of that team or determine what does the roadmap need to be for this particular group. Um, you know, where, where are we now and where do we want to get to? <clears throat> uh, one of the things I like about SAM, and, and I, talk about, I talked earlier about CMMI. Uh, has anybody here ever done work in an organization that is a CMMI ranked organization? Anybody? Okay, a couple of unlucky people. Uh, most everybody lucky, or luckier, right? Yeah, what I've always found with CMM, you know, CMM and CMMI is they are overwhelming. I mean, they're cr crushing amounts of paperwork, crushing amounts, right? And, and, and at the end of the day, from a commercial standpoint, they were, I would characterize as being not terribly successful. And I think maybe I'm being chari charitable with that characterization. Uh, in the US, uh, we really only saw government contractors and like offshore firms, uh, you know, trying to claim uh, you know some, some sort of quality with their process. Those are the only organizations that really cared about it on the government contractor side because um, you know, there were certain purchasing requirements in certain cases. Again, the offshore folks trying to de demonstrate a level of, uh, of, of 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 competence from a branding standpoint. Um, but we really, you know, we don't see any commercial organizations uh, that, that, that have widespread adoption to CMMI. So one thing I like, and, and, and again, I think it's because it's overbearing and it's too complicated. One of the things I like about SAM is that it is much uh, simpler and less onerous. <clears throat> but 
as we've as we've seen going out and working with organizations, uh, even 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 Sam's level of uh, rigor uh, you know, causes heartburn with certain uh, you know, with certain organizations. And so, if you look at the structure of Sam, there are four different business functions. You look at your you know, governance. You know what's the overall environment in which software is being done in this organization. Uh, you have your construction. What are you doing during the building of the software to help? In, you know, help ensure that security is appropriately included. Uh, there's verification. After we've built the software, what activities are we undertaking in order to test to make sure we are successful, uh, putting the appropriate uh, properties in, and then, uh, and then operations. And uh, I, I think as we see OpenSAM evolve, and say that you may have thoughts on this, but uh, I think as we see OpenSAM evolve, especially looking to make it relevant inside of organizations that are pushing forward DevOps, I think we're gonna start to see um, more thought or, 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 or some, some growth or expansion of the things that you look for from a maturity standpoint at operations. As we start to break down the barriers between operations and security and development, um, I, I think that the, uh, that's an area that's going to, uh, you know, we're, we're gonna see more, um, some you know, turmoil is probably the wrong word, but, uh, but, but uh, you know, additional velocity of changes for that part of the model. You know, underneath each of those business functions, there's uh, three different security practices are defined, and again, I think for the, uh, under operations, we're gonna see um, you know, some, some changes there. So if you look at using OpenSAM in practice, uh, you know, the way we've typically done these uh, you know, assessments is go into an organization, uh, you know, gather some data, they'll go interview various stakeholders, and, uh, you know, and then the organization gets a scorecard. So across those 12 security practices, uh, you get a rating from zero, meaning you're doing nothing, to three, meaning you're at the highest level of maturity. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you know, again, a, I think a lot of organizations have found this to be a very valuable tool. It's not as complicated as CMMI. It's much more tractable. Um, <clears throat> you, know, you can come in, you can see a set of steps that you can use to advance the state of your practices. Uh, you know, so you've got a yardstick measuring where you are now as well as giving you some actionable, actionable steps to move forward. Um, and from this, we've started to collect data along with other folks in this open, uh, open SAM benchmarking uh, initiative. And so what we're doing is we're taking data from a number of organizations and we're anonymizing it and starting to create a data set that we can start to use for industry benchmarking. So an organization can say, I'm a finance or I'm a uh, you know, banking and finance organization with uh, you know, 10,000 people. Uh, you know, I look at other, I, I look at our peers and I see in these areas they're more advanced than us, in these areas we seem to be more, be more advanced. You know, that lets me go to management and say, here's how I compare to my peers. Um, you know, that's uh, you know, something that's uh, you know, is, is valuable because it lets you see what other people are doing. Uh, and really, business leaders crave data. That's a, a, a real challenge that I think we've seen in the application or software security space is too often the business perceives it as good hygiene, right? Like, you should take a shower every day, but you don't have to, right? And I think a lot of organizations look at software security that way where they say, yeah, we should be doing all that, but I actually need to do this other stuff. I need to get these features deployed as well. And that's a, uh, you know, and, and that's a, it, it's been a challenge, I think, for OWASP trying to make application security visible and to get organizations to make those risk-based decisions about what they do in their programs. But now what we can start to do is we can start to build up a set of data, and that lets you say, you know, here's where we are, and here's where other organizations like us are. Um, you know, that's one of the things that I think is really valuable about the data sets that have been released from like uh, the White Hat folks and the Veracode folks looking at vulnerability prevalence remediation rates. You know, that lets you point to this third party data set and say, here's how many vulnerabilities people in these industries are finding. Here's what the percentage they're fixing and here's what they're fixing. Let's look at how we're doing in our organization and let's, you know, that, that gives us at least a justification to say other people who are presumably smart are doing it to this level. If we want to be presumably smart, we should probably be at their level as well. All right? <clears throat> There's a, you know, because organizations want to make sure that they're not, uh, you know, late to the party, right? Uh, you know, but they also want to make sure that they're not overspending. And so, um, you know, if a big focus for us 
was to start to drill down and get data at the team level rather than the organization level. Um, because again, in any organization of size that you go into, you know, they have any number of different development teams and they probably have a different set of practices for each development team. There may be common infrastructure that is shared, there may be common practices or training that is shared, um, but you know, especially if you look at organizations that have grown through acquisitions, um, you know, the organizations that are geographically distributed, you know, if, if you go into an organization and say, what are you doing for application security? And they say, we use static scanner XYZ. You know, an excellent question is, well, what percentage of your code actually goes through that scanner? Or we do pen testing with ABC. You know, what, let, let's, let's talk about what percentage, what is the coverage level that you have? Um, and, and, and again, so that's something I think is very important. When you look at the maturity, you need to look at the maturity of an individual team because as you see, you know, certain teams are going to be adopting different sets of practices, uh, meaning they're gonna be at different levels of maturity. Uh, another thing, uh, just talking about the data model that we've used for this benchmarking, uh, again, the granularity is at the team level versus being at the organization level. Um, and we also are collecting organization and team metadata. Um, so looking at what's the employee count, uh, you know, where we can get it, some information about the count of developers versus the count of uh, you know, application security folks. Um, you know, what is the industry or sector that that organization is in and uh, you know, also what, uh, you know, what region is that organization. Uh, you know, what, what organization, you know, where is that organization based? Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, we, and we allow you to, to, to capture this data at different levels of granularity, either at, you know, again, a lot of the historical data that we have is at the organization level, um, but now we're starting to gather information to the team level, and so the data model allows you to capture information at both of those levels, and then when you query that data set, the idea is that you can limit it to the set of views. Uh, you can either accept more data where you're going to get more variability and potentially less data quality, or you can constrain it and say, well, I only want to know what certain teams are doing, in which case there's going to be less data available, uh, but data that may have qualities that you prefer. So what limits SAM adoption in the, you know, in, in the real world? <clears throat> um, you know, the, the same thing that limits it all the time is ambitious development timelines. Um, you know, and that gives, uh, you know, in, in a lot of organizations, that gives too many development teams the ability to say, like, no thanks. Like, oh, hey, you want to come in and look at our maturity? You want to, you, know, you want to get us doing security stuff? Uh, no thanks. We've got a deadline, right? <clears throat> you know, that's something that we see all too often. Uh, you know, certain regulatory regimes have helped to uh, make this less of an option for development teams. Other organizations, often after a breach, uh, get a little bit more of the religion. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, that's, a, that's a, a challenge in a lot of organizations. And, uh, you know, again, it comes down to limited resources, right? If I have, you know, if I have developers and they're spending time filling out SAM surveys and talking about their security roadmap, they're not fixing bugs, they're not implementing new features. Um, and, and there's also politics. You know, there's, uh, you know, in a lot of organizations, um, there's a push and pull between the different lines of business and their development teams versus the security organization. You know, some organizations have a centralized security team that is very strong. Uh, others, uh, you know, security is more of, a, of an afterthought. You know, some organizations have very strong audit, you know, internal IT audit departments. Again, each organization is different. And in a lot of cases, the, you know, the, the politics makes it challenging to adapt something like, uh, you know, like, like Sam. Uh, and again, there's always other competing priorities. Time spent doing security is time spent not doing something else. Um, and time spent talking about your maturity uh, and your roadmap is time spent not doing something else that could have been, uh, you know, that could have been done. So if we look at the big drivers that we're seeing, um, you know, and this is, uh, you know, again, um, if you look at startup companies, they've always had this mentality. But what we're starting to see increasingly in the financial services space, which is you know, traditionally an, an industry that moves, uh, you know, value security and, 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 and moves comparatively slow versus startup, uh, startups are a increasing desire for speed. Um, you know, there's, and we're, we're seeing organizations that we never thought would talk about this before. They're saying like, ah, yes, you know, we've decided that we're going to be agile. Uh, I wish I had a copy. There's a great Dilbert cartoon there where the pointy-haired boss says, uh, you know, hey, we're going to start doing agile development, you know, where, uh, you know, it, it, instead of doing any design or, uh, you know, or, or testing or anything like that, we're just going to start writing code and complaining immediately. 
you know, Wallace says, this is great, and then the point here, Wallace says, and that, like, that description consists of your training, right? <laughs> yeah, so, we, uh, so a lot of organizations don't necessarily understand uh, what, what Agile is, they understand what DevOps is, but they know they want it, um, which is a little scary, but it's happening because there is a, a real drive for, uh, you know, for, for the time to market advantages. How can we move faster? How can we move quicker? Uh, you know, I think we're also seeing uh, with uh, you know, certain things in Agile and DevOps is a desire to increase quality, uh, and there's also cost concerns. Um, and this is important, and again, something I think will be more accepted by this audience versus an ISSA or an ISACA. Um, just like a lot of migration to cloud didn't come from a great strategy, it came from the lines of business demanding, oh, we need this flexibility, you know, we, we have to be able to do this, therefore, if you're in my way, I'm just gonna go around you. Uh, similarly, I think DevOps pressures aren't gonna come from uh, you know, the smartest CIO of the year who's like, you know what we need to do, guys? DevOps, right? Instead, it's gonna come from the development teams that said, hey, we need to be able to deploy more quickly. We need to be able to build features faster. We need to be able to respond to our competition. Um, and our current constraints or the current practices we have are holding us back from doing that. Uh, how do we get to DevOps? Um, this is an interesting, uh, you know, this may not be entirely technically correct, but I think captures, especially if you look at it from a business standpoint, you know, in the good old days, everybody had their own silo and got left alone just to do whatever they wanted to do in the waterfall days, right? So you had like, okay, well, write me the requirements document and hand that off, and I don't need to talk to your people, just make sure that you have enough system shells, right? Uh, well, that, you know, the world figure out like, hey, this doesn't work. And so you got Agile, which is really looking at combining these business users with the developers, right? How do we get a customer to sit with us and explain these requirements so that we can be more responsive? You know, the next move that we're seeing now is looking and saying, hey, having the business work with development and build the software they want is great, but it's not great when you throw that over the wall and operations can't support it and we have downtime and it takes us too long to roll forward, roll back, and other things like that. And so that's what you see with a lot of the move to DevOps, which is saying, how do we make, you know, how do we make change even faster? How do we make these increments auditable? Uh, but how, and, and how do we break down the walls between the folks that are developing the software and the folks that have to support it in operations? You know, I think that creates a great opportunity for security to also get involved in this and say, hey, I have a set of concerns uh, and, 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 and I have a set of tools that I think can help you accomplish your goals. Uh, I don't know if, uh, if any folks here were in Aaron Weaver's talk uh, the first talk in this session, really great view. I, I think he's got a great view talking about, like, we need to make these security tools that are easier to use by the developers because if we can do that, then the developers might actually use them and then we're going to see more adoption of these tools. <clears throat> um, and, and so, you know, looking at, and, and how do we make all of this stuff work together so that security can no longer, or can be viewed less as an impediment and more of an enabler and a risk manager. Um, so again, I think that the shift to DevOps has a great, is a great opportunity for software security teams. Uh, you know, the challenge is how do you layer in the things that security more traditionally cares about, you know, looking at the maturity of practices, looking at uh, you know, these things like auditability, uh, things of that nature. You know, how can you apply those techniques in organizations that are just like focused on, I need to go faster and, and do DevOps, whatever that might be. Um, you know, so again, more reasons to do Sam. You know, talking about the opportunity cost. All right, it's uh, you know, if, if you're if you're going to create a roadmap and follow that roadmap, um, a big pushback that we've seen in a lot of organizations is nobody wants to get a big zero on the report. Right, if if a development team is not doing any security stuff. Uh, it's, it's almost a waste of time to come in and say like, okay, we're going to do your open SAM assessment. Talk to, you, talk to me about your static analysis program. And they're like, don't have one. Talk to me about your dynamic analysis program. Don't have one. Talk to me about your security metrics. Don't have any, right? <laughs> and so it's, you go down with the clipboard and you're like, nope, 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 nope. Right? That's number one, that's, that's, that's not fun. <laughs> that's also a horrible waste of time <laughs> in those cases, right? <clears throat> and, uh, you know, and, and in a lot of cases, it is a very expensive way to do a, a, a heavy-handed assessment of a team is a expensive way to confirm what you already knew. 
Um, and, and, and typically what you knew is that you know, this team has fewer security practices. You know, we bought them a tool, they're not using it. Um, we got them some training, those people all left or forgot it or you know, they haven't been encouraged to, uh, to make use of it. Um, you know, we, uh, we told them to do security requirements and it's a one page of bullet points, uh, you know, whatever that might be. Yeah. So what can you do to help increase the uptake of a maturity model, uh, you know, specifically OpenSAM? So it's, it's important to show value early in the process. You know, that's, that's a critical thing. If people are asking, like, what am I, uh, you know, why, why are we doing this? You, you've got to be able to, to show them, well, we're doing this because what it gets us is, uh, you know, is this thing of value. Uh, also looking at ways to make the data capture as simple as possible. Now, this is also something where you've got to work across the different teams to see where you can get them to potentially help you with that. You know, and, and, and honestly, this is something that if you want to be successful is typically done in an iterative fashion. It's not something where you can come in from the top down and expect to get uh, you know, deep coverage across your entire set of, uh, you know, uh, you know, across the entire set of, of teams that you have developing software in your organization. And you've got to be flexible. You've got to be you know, ready and able to, to pivot. <clears throat> so one of the things that we found to be valuable is that benchmarking, to be able to say, like, hey, if you think your team is so great and smart and, you know, like, the Etsy guys are doing 50 deploys per minute and you're doing 51 deploys per minute and you're totally awesome DevOps pipeline, you know, <clears throat> you know, how can you show, or, you know, you can show value by benchmarking, right? How do you, how do you stack up against other players in the industry, about other folks? <clears throat> uh, how do you show value to these development teams to show, hey, if you adopt these security practices, you know, you're going to find these vulnerabilities earlier in the process. You're going to move this to the left of the process. All right. <clears throat> also, we looked at ways, how do you make SAM less disruptive? How do we make it so that it isn't a giant burden? Uh, you know, it, it doesn't feel like an audit when someone comes through. And how do you communicate those, the, the success of SAM to show, you know, like, hey, We've done this ass assessment of our maturity. We've made progress in our maturity with these teams in these areas, and here's the benefit that those teams saw from that. Um, so again, uh, first important strategy is conduct data-driven benchmarking. Um, you know, and that's uh, that's something we've found that that is a great. I, I don't know if it's the right justification, but it's one that often tends to work. If you can show, you know, here's data about what you guys are doing, and here's data about what your peers are doing. Nobody wants to, you know, no, nobody wants to be behind their peers. Um, and this is something where you can often pick a team and baseline their maturity. So pick a team, especially in a situation where uh, you think you're going to have positive results, uh, and, and, and start to use them as a case study. And that's something, you know, we were working with a really large uh, enterprise. Um, and again, they had you know, 500 dev teams or something spread throughout the organization. And, uh, you know, and, and, and the central security people said, we know most of these people are horrible, right? But we think that these three teams, because of the lines of business or the products that they're responsible for, we, we think that these three teams are actually using XYZ tools that we've you know, bought for them, that they're using this stuff. <clears throat> you know, well, that let us go in and say, well, let's take a look. Since, since it's not going to be zeros across the board, let's go and look at what it is realistic for a team inside of this enterprise to accomplish, right? Because they've made some decisions, they've adopted some of these tools, they've got um, you know, organization-specific um, information. You know, let's go and let's, let's use these folks as the example because then you can start to say, well, where do you guys, where, you know, other teams in this organization, where do you want to fall in relation to these people? <coughs> Uh, and then you can start to go out from them. Again, you know, initially looking for pockets of excellence. Uh, you know, what's the, you, you want to like catch somebody doing something right, I think is, uh, I read in a management book once. Uh, you know, you want to go find the teams that are actually doing something right so that you can highlight those and then start to use those as your examples moving forward. Um, and collecting this data for benchmarking is a necessary evil, and the emphasis here is on necessary. If you're not collecting this data, um, you know, then it makes it more challenging to point to those teams and you say, well, those guys are good at doing code analysis. It's much better if you can go and say, look, those guys have incorporated the source code analysis into their weekly build across the 10 applications in the portfolio they're responsible for. Right? They, these guys have a certain level of maturity, and they're getting value out of the activities that they're doing. Um, and so, uh, you know, being able to collect that data and point to it with specific and, and in measurable terms 
gives you that yardstick to use across other parts of the organization. Um, you know, streamline the collection process. You know, there's a number of tricks here. Uh, in some organizations, you can in invoke a higher authority. You know, hey, the internal audit said you had to do this. In some organizations, that'll get you laughed out of the room. Uh, in some organizations, they'll say, what's internal audit? Uh, in other organizations, they'll say, oh, internal audit said it. Well, I guess I'd better do it so that I don't have this uh, person down here you know, later on. You know, hopefully, you have some existing uh, things like an application inventory that you can use to help uh, you know, give a starting point. You, know, you may already have some of the information that you have um, you know, in, in an organization. Also, another thing that we've found is that if you look across the four big areas of OpenSAM, uh, the governance uh, function tends to be, uh, there, there's less drift within an enterprise. You know, they, they may have very different construction, verification, and operations practices if they you know, have different lines of business responsible for each of those things. But there does tend to be more commonality or more overlap with governance. Just because you have an organization in the financial services space, they're going to have a team that is responsible for certain aspects of compliance. Um, and so you may see more commonalities. So you may be able to give teams a starting point to say, hey, from a governance standpoint, this is what we usually see in teams inside this organization. Let's talk about how you guys potentially vary from that or what, what of this we can just automatically reuse. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, Different organizations work in different ways. In some organizations, you can send out a self-assessment or send out assessment forms to folks you know, via some sort of a workflow, and people, you know, some percentage will respond to them. You know, usually, like regardless of anything, you're, you, you know, you're usually not going to get immediate uh, responses from a high percentage. But some organizations, people are better at working on their own and you know, providing this information. In other words, in other ones, you've got to go more hand-to-hand -hand combat and team-to-team -team and say, hey, well, let's schedule a time. Let's sit down for a lunch. Let's have a coffee. Uh, and we can, you know, we can work through this worksheet that you, that you all have. Um, and again, you know, doing this in person is, is, is you know, typically you would do as a last result, but that may be the thing that's required in your organization to get them to behave uh, or to get them to you know, comply with the behaviors that you, you want to see. And you want to make sure that you're minimizing the impact on development teams. <coughs> Um, because at the, at the end of the day, that's the thing that's going to really impact your efforts is if you're perceived as taking value away from those development teams. And also, uh, bribes are incredibly effective, which uh, you can bribe with Amazon, you can bribe with uh, Starbucks. Um, uh, you know, that's something that we've found can be very, uh, it can be very helpful, uh, even if it's a minimal thing. I think there's a, a human nature uh, your response, where if somebody gives you something, like they feel bad if they don't, if you don't give anything back, um, and so that's something where even you know minimal gifts uh, or incentives, you can help get people moving. And so that's something where if you look and say, you know, how much does each of these in-person meetings cost? Oh, okay, well, if, you know, for my time, cool. Well, it's worth a twenty-five dollar gift card to something. If you know, for each one of these meetings, I can skip because I got this person to fill out that survey. So if you look at the flexibility of or, you know, the trade-off between budget and time and, and, and various resources. Um, you know, that may be an option. <clears throat> you know, one of the things we've also found is that you have to be flexible in the depth of the data that you expect to get from these teams. And there may be value in going in a breadth first. You know, after you've got your initial cases, there may be value in going in a breadth first approach. Uh, let's learn at least a little bit about what these, about what every team is doing. And then we can start to fill in the gaps from there you know, to find out, hey, we bought this tool. Let's go and talk to all these teams about their static analysis practices or, or their dynamic analysis practices so that we can at least know, is this tool being used or do we need to push, uh, do we need to push this rollout? And so you can make decisions to go deep for a specific team to know a lot about their practices. Or you may want to go shallow and just say, hey, I want to know about training. Or I want to know about what sort of testing you're doing. Or I want to know if you're doing threat modeling. Uh, again. Uh, and, and so you're uh, looking at a preliminary lightweight survey so that you can start to identify the teams at the most risk um, or, or, or where there's a, you know, a larger mandate, and those are the teams then where it's easier to go in and, uh, and, and go much deeper. You know, so looking at breadth, you know, looking at a couple of different teams versus depth, saying you know, we've, got, uh, or, or, you know, we've, we've got a little bit about every team. <clears throat> you know, and again, you may have... Uh, uh, you know, different, uh, different factors, uh, and it really comes down to the 80-20 rule of like, what's the information that's going to be the easiest for me to collect from these teams so that I can start to assemble a view into this without being perceived as being in the way of, of, of progress. 
And finally, you need to explicitly communicate value to the leadership and to the development managers. Um, you know, and this is a, uh, you know, again, a, a critical aspect. You've got to be able to justify to say, hey, you know, we did, uh, you know, this SAM assessment, which is not in and of its own, uh, you know, it's not in and of itself, isn't necessarily inherently valuable, but by advancing this team's maturity from here to here, we've decreased their bug resolution time from here to here, right? We've been able to, you know, we took action, we trained these developers, and because we trained these developers, now we're introducing fewer security vulnerabilities, right? <clears throat> or, you know, now that we have a, uh, you know, security testing that's being incorporated into the development process, now we're reducing, you know, we're putting 80% fewer bugs out, you know, you know, security bugs out into production. Um, so you've got to be able to demonstrate this value, um, you know, showing as people increase in maturity, you have good outcomes on the other side of that. Um, and, and again, this is a, a situation where if this were a, a technical problem that could be solved, I would be much happier because I'm good at solving technical problems. The challenge is it's an organizational behavior problem. Uh, it's a management problem, and those are, at least for me, those are, those are certainly less tractable. Um, but again, being able to communicate these things. We've also seen some interesting stuff with gamification, to be able to show these teams against one another to show, well, hey, this team has adopted this set of practices, right? Uh, you know, nobody wants to be last on the leaderboard. You know, similar to you know, looking, if you want to go to management and justify to say, well, you know, we need to do this in our enterprise because other enterprises are doing more or doing better stuff. Yeah, within teams, nobody wants to be last on the leaderboard. And so, uh, you know, and, you know, and that's not even necessarily a business justification, but if, it, if you can elicit the response that you want, who cares? Um, and so that's something where, uh, you know, this is, uh, like th those sort of like gamification models, I think there's some really interesting stuff that could be done there. Um, and, that, and, and having organizations or having groups compete on maturity, um, you know, is, is something that we've seen, uh, you know, we've seen get some teams to start to take steps and to move forward um, where they'd previously been reticent to do that because nobody wants to be at the bottom of the, uh, nobody wants to be at the bottom of the leaderboard. So in conclusion, again, benchmarking data is really valuable. Uh, that drive or that urge to, uh, you know, to, 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 to be better than or at least not be the worst, uh, you know, both at an enterprise level as well as on an individual team level, that can spur behavior and get people to do the things that you want them to do. Uh, you got to show value early and often. If you're going to be doing benchmarking, you have to be able to say, you have to be able to show on the other side, we made a change in maturity and that allowed for a change in our performance that we're gonna view as being better. Where you know, fewer security vulnerabilities introduced, vulnerabilities fixed faster, fewer things made into production, whatever those measures might be, whichever ones are gonna resonate in your organization, you gotta be able to show that progress. Uh, you know, again, once you've got your test cases, you wanna look at the breadth, uh, you know, how, you know, how much you know across the enterprise because that lets you potentially identify hot spots or trouble teams where you need to focus more on maturity. Uh, and finally, over communicate. You know, this is something where uh, you know people have to know what you're doing, why you're doing it. You've got to be able to communicate your results to them uh, if you want to keep uh, you know, keep momentum. And uh, if you would like to email John, you can email him at john at denimgroup.com, uh, or I'm dan at denimgroup.com, and I'll uh, be happy to answer any questions that folks have. Questions? Oh, there we go. Um, so the question is, do we have any ROI or statistics data? We don't yet, um, but that's the type of stuff, like initially what we're trying to collect is a data set for the benchmarking of, of like what other organizations look like. Um, the next step after that, I think, is to look at those outcomes so that we can start to see if you deploy this technology or if you adopt these practices, then we see this reduction or whatever. So we're not, we're not, we're not there, there yet. Um, but I think that that is the direction that we're that we need to go. And so, like right now, we've seen inside of organizations, um, you know, we've we've seen folks be able to demonstrate that. Hey, we trained this team in whatever, and then look, their vulnerability introduction graph goes down. Um, that's all data that is internal to those organizations. Uh, that they they haven't been folks have been willing to anonymize and release a lot of their um, the kind of open SAM maturity level data. Uh, we've seen fewer examples of people that are willing to anonymize and release their outcome data. Because uh, if they say, well, hey, we fixed, 
80% of our vulnerabilities, and then their customers could turn around and be like, well, that means you left 20% of the vulnerabilities in. <laughs> um, that's been a challenge. So uh, I, th I think over time, I think we need, I think the industry needs to get a better set of metrics that they, that they use to, to describe favorable outcomes. Um, and I also think over time, I think uh, with proper anonymization, hopefully folks will be more willing to, uh, to release that type of data. Yep. So much of the this evaluation of mm -hmm. this, uh, the, the challenge I'm having at the moment is the definition of yes. Uh -huh. I'm trying to make it stop. I'm trying to figure out ways that every yes has a limit, right? Because that's the only thing. So there has to be improvement. Like mm -hmm. every time somebody says, I'm doing this, there should be some evidence. Right, right. Someone, right? And, and so what Dennis is talking about is like what evidence, uh, what's the veracity of the data that you're getting? Because if people ask, yeah, like, hey, do you do training? Yeah, we did training. We had like a one hour lunch and learn at, uh, at whatever. And so that's a great question. And, and, and the open SAM model accommodates this by having uh, you know, two levels, and I forget the description of the levels, but it's essentially like a low level, a high level or a low level assessment. And a low level or a high level assessment is like a tabletop tell me exercise. Like how often do you do static analysis? All the time. Like, oh, good work, <laughs> right? The, the uh, lower level uh, you know, assessments actually require that type of evidence of Oh, you do static analysis? Cool. Well, let me see the report from last night's run. Like, uh, <laughs> um, but that's an excellent point. Is uh, but but a, a challenge there is um, as you increase the requirement for evidence, you decrease lying, which is a net positive, but you also decrease the likelihood of compliance because you increase the requirement. You increase the level of effort required to, to show that evidence. Um, and one of the things that we've been playing with, and I think this actually dovetails real well, like if you look at things like DevOps pipeline, integrating security into DevOps pipelines and things like that, some cool stuff that we've seen is if you've got, if once you've got that rolled into automation as a security, as the security team, if you're getting the, all the Jenkins things are sending back the security results, you can collect that data and be like, yeah, they're, yes, they're doing static analysis because there's, look, their weekly run ran on Tuesday and here's the results or their nightly build that did that and I've got that there. And so I think with DevOps, a, a cool thing about that is certain aspects of open SAM data collection can be automated. Um, you know, as you say, like, hey, you're executing this stuff, cool, well, just like auto send me the evidence. Once you've instrumented that process and have that data flowing up, then from an application security standpoint, from a centralized standpoint, you can say, yeah, I feel like these guys are doing whatever because I, I can see that they did a manual test here, I can see that they did dynamic or static or whatever it is, and so you're collecting that evidence along the way just as, a, as an artifact of that stuff being included there, so. Great question. Any other questions? Yes. Right, and so, uh, so the question is, how does the benchmarking compare to BSIM? Um, that's what we're working to see. Uh, I don't think we have enough data yet, although I think, uh, I, I've talked to a couple people and I, I, I'm hoping to collect a whole bunch more data. Um, yeah, I think we're in a couple tens of records right now and hoping to be you know, 80 to 100 here shortly. That'll give us like record parity from a sample size with the BSIM folks. Um, I, I, you know, I, I would argue that their, their data is collected in a, a more structured manner at this point. Um, so I think that the open SAM data, the data set should be north of there so that you can kind of slice and dice and adjust for the variability in the collection. But uh, yeah, I, I think it would be really interesting to see the juxtaposition of those data sets once, uh, you know, once, once we've got a little bit more and can start publishing stuff. And so, so your question is who owns the result of your open SAM testing internally? Right, right. Okay, yeah. And, and so in most, most organizations we see that are pushing on open SAM, they have an app security team, like a central app security team, and they're the ones that ultimately own that. They may have liaisons or embeds in the different teams, but ultimately that data rolls up centrally. And I think that gives you the value of being able to juxtapose teams against one another if you can have a central authority that says, We've collected data from 10 out of our 50 development teams, and here's how they ended up, as opposed to each you know, team kind of saying, like, uh, you know, it's, it's tough to get 
uh, buy-in on OpenSAM across the teams without some sort of central authority to, to, to promote that, I think. Right. So, what's your advice of turning this uh, seemingly mundane activity that no one likes in the beginning uh -huh. into a fun exercise? Right. So, how do you take an activity that no one likes, which is uh, social security benchmarking, <laughs> and make it into a fun activity? Um, I think that the, I don't have a great answer for that yet, but what I think we have seen is that if you can get to a certain critical mass, that that is the if you can kind of like bully your way into a certain critical mass of we have X number of teams have done this, then that starts to encourage compliance for the other folks. Um, and again, on the, on, the, on the carrot side versus the stick side, uh, gift cards and things like that can be used. You know, so that may be the strategy uh, like that. We, we've seen that be very effective. Again, and if you're, if you're saying like, you're saving me an hour long meeting and it cost me a $25 gift card, like done and done. Like that's, uh, yeah, that, I'll do that every day of the week. Um, if you can do that to get to a certain population with, you know, you have a certain percentage of the population, uh, then that encourages compliance because it shows, like, well, all these other guys have done it. Um, I would love, uh, you know, I don't know if you can make the collection of that data fun, but as I talk about with Dennis, if, you, if you're starting to instrument pipelines and things like that, you might not be able to make the data collection fun, but you can make the data collection automatic, which is even better than fun because then it doesn't take anyone's time. It just happens, so. All right. Well, thank you all very much, and I'll be around if uh, you need to check it out.